Ohio Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise, with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Great to have you in on a Tuesday. It's Hale Varsity Radio. We're presented by Currents. Uh, LeBron going for immortality with the scoring record. We'll stop there and also uh, get the latest going on with Nebraska football. Uh, Longtime coach Ron Brown will join us in one hour. Uh, Jeff Smith, Hall of Fame basketball coach and assistant for Nebraska with us also in hour two. Big showdown tonight between the Metros unbeaten and number one. Bell West makes their roadie south against uh, top 10 team Lincoln Southeast. I'll be on the call for that with Jeff Smith. We'll get a preview from Coach Smith next hour on that matchup, the state of Husker basketball. And Coach Smith has spent uh, a little bit of time around LeBron. So we'll get his take on uh, one of the absolute best there. Mitch Sherman in about 20 minutes as uh, we gear up. Some media availability a little bit later on this week with Nebraska's new wide receiver and tight ends coach, so we look forward to that. Numbers to get in and join us today on Hale Varsity Radio, 466-3776-4676-800-825-5865. can email the show, chris at halevarsity.com. You can hear us uh, all over the state with the Hale Varsity Network. And uh, always catch us on ESPN Lincoln, Facebook, and Twitter. You can watch the show as well on Hale Varsity's YouTube channel and the Hale Varsity Radio Twitter handle at HVarsity Radio. You can watch the show, hear the show there. Catch Damon and Andrew in the morning, 7 to 9. Catch us on the way home, 4 to 6. Guys, gorgeous day outside. More like uh, Husker baseball weather. Uh, we'll take it and uh, we, we'll, we'll kind of. Use two hands on this thing so we don't fumble it moving forward. Super Bowl looms. We'll spend some time with those matchups as well. But uh, Nebraska football in the midst of kind of figuring themselves out. We know what their emphasis has been in recruiting. We know the work ethic associated with trying to land the right players, project how they're going to help the football team. How much weight can they put on? How fast and explosive will they be at the college level? And let's comb all parts of the earth or, or the United States to, uh, to make that happen, be it the Northeast or Texas or the portal. Uh, but Nebraska's done a good job, and specifically the 500-mile radius and in-state being the emphasis. And I want to ask both of you this. What's going into a football season and you're both used to change as young as you are Elijah and Connor you've lived a football life of every four to five years there's new it's not new division it's not uh, necessarily new expectations but it's new head coach or new head coach and new AD what do you expect from Nebraska football year in, year out. Are you at the point where, dude, a bowl game would be great? Is that your new bar? Or did you grow up with, well, they'll get nine. It may not always look pretty. or There may be some embarrassment, but they'll get nine. Or are you somewhere in between? My own, like, football life and history was Oklahoma was going to make you weep. Miami would make you run. And you'd end up ten and two right around the uh, the top ten. That that's my football life, and then it got really good as I went into college. And now the last ten plus years has been interesting. And what Nebraska's not done for the longest of time is kind of settled somewhere in the middle. That middle part being you meet expectations you don't overachieve where there's false slash fool's gold 11 and 2 sparty ring, ring a bell 
and you don't underachieve where how are you three and nine and you have a billion one loss one score loss games how do you not let it go the right way one of those times and it's been over a couple of years it's been a history of it so what is actual on par for nebraska football right now coach rule uh has been doing some some media rounds and listen he knows it's a rebuild but it's it's a different because of what he's walking into the room he has he's super excited about far different than a temple far different than a baylor that's a key point to me with Nebraska football, where what do you what are you starting with? What are you walking into? Right? You had a disastrous situation, according to Coach Frost, post Riley. You had a disastrous situation post Bo with Riley because of of his management style. Not that he doesn't know football or isn't a good football mind, but just the the leadership style of a pro style versus a hands-on well, approach. And let's not put it all on Mike Riley. It was, I, no, it, it was his leadership qualities combined with those of the athletic department as a whole at the sure, time. Sure, very fair. But the point is, is you've had some sort of, you've, you've never matched patterns, mm. <laughs> okay? <laughs> you've, you've, you've never matched patterns with every change you've made administratively or with the head coach. I think that's different now. Tread likes pra- plaid. Matt Rule probably loves him some plaid or or whatever, right? If we're going to go fashion for a well, moment. Well, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I was trying to think like goofy wh- pants and a what, right? Well, when was the last time Nebraska had an AD and a, a coach that stylistically matched up? And I guess you could make an argument for for Bill Moose and Scott Frost, but probably not in the right ways. So you'd go back to <laughs> I don't, even Ta- Tom Osborne and. And Bo Pelini didn't quite see eye to eye with with how no, they wanted was, to make things. There was the football background. Well, I mean, at least both you those had calm guys, and stoic and irate and jugular. But but both of those guys did their be all end all was same, winning same football things. games. Right, do it the right way, do it a similar way with hard work and yeah, I, I get it. So to my original blabber point here, what what is what is football to you? What should it be? Not year one, but but overall. And to me, the, the, the premise has been you've had talent, you've had underdevelopment, you've underachieved. You've had a bunch of three, four, five win seasons, and you, you're probably three to four wins below, even with a, with a lucky bounce here and there. You're probably six or seven win teams based on the talent you have. And I know they're not lighting the world up from a recruiting ranking standpoint, comparatively to who they're chasing in the Big Ten. But they're not even beating teams they out-recruit, and they haven't for years. Connor, I want to get your take. I don't want to let me influence you, because we have Schmitty, who is 90s. We have me, who is late Era, 2000s. Era, not age. Early, early 2010s, <laughs> yes. Yes, and then your age is now kind of, I mean, 3 and 9 is pretty much all you know since uh, you've really been following the Huskers every single So what do you think is realistic expectations for Nebraska? Well, my temporary one is 6-6, six and six, I think. For this year, I think that's a fair one um, for everybody to have because we've seen programs turn around too in this age of college football where we talk about NIL and the transfer portal nearly every single day, right? And we've seen teams have essentially two year rebuilds where they're all of a sudden a contender in their conference. Now, we talked a couple weeks ago about maybe instead of jumping 50 spots in those statistical categories, maybe cutting that in half to 25, I kind of take the same approach with this. Don't expect, you know, a, a, a championship appearance in the Big Ten or anything like that. I think 6-6 six and six for me right now, get to a postseason, no matter what that postseason looks like, get there because you haven't been able to, and give the fans... Get me to Detroit in December. Think I would kill to watch a Nebraska football game on a Thursday night at 4.30 in in Detroit. Taking or, on Western Michigan. <laughs> or or at the Liberty Bowl. Or so, just just give us something, right? Look at you getting closer to January with your liter, liter, be, literally uh, Liberty Bowl designation. I mean, I, just any sort of postseason. I personally don't care what it looks like as a, as a student right now. Just get there. And that's all that matters. <laughs> and then after that, then you can set your sights on something bigger and keep building and building and building. So, I mean, by something bigger, I look at the expectations of Husker football as being, uh, as Brennan says in the comments here, a perennial top 25 team. I don't think you need to be a team 
that necessarily finishes in the top 25 I think that's a year or two expectation for me. But but like I I think Nebraska football deserves to be like the fans deserve to have a team that that you might not finish in the top 25 every single year. You should you should be in that conversation for the entire year. If you're not in the top 25, you're in others receiving votes and you know what? If you can get a win next week against name your Big 10 foe, Penn State Iowa, Wisconsin, you'll make that jump up into the top 25. That's what guess what I what I mean whenever I said a couple weeks ago, I want Nebraska to be playing in games that are meaningful in November. Enough to keep you relevant on the national scene. That's what that's what I think Nebraska should be. You'll mix in the top 10 finishes, which in a couple of years that'll be college football playoff. But mm-hmm. for the most part, year in, year out, you're in the top 25. And you know what? If you have a strong finish in November, you're gonna you have a chance to play yourself in to uh, you know, college football playoff or at least bubble quote unquote flirt with the idea right Mm -hmm. nebraska is the only big 10 team that has not been in the top 25 indiana was top 10 sparty was top 10 purdue was teens northwestern was ranked most of the year the two years they went to the big 10 championship game illinois has emerged as a top 10 team or not top 10 but top 25 Nebraska's it. Rutgers, I guess, is there. Maryland was ranked briefly this year. It showed flashes. Right, but I mean, they still finished 8-5, and five, and we'll get to some emails here. But, you know, I think hit, hit the target. The target being if you have uh, enough talent to win seven games based on your schedule, Win seven games. Don't go three and nine or four and eight. And flirt with taking down a college football playoff team. <clears throat> and then go get beat by double digits a week later on the road. That's the biggest thing is finding some some consistency uh, in, in your play, but also in your coaching. And to, to year one expectations, that's a different take than – the following years, right, right. And, and I think we're all there. But Saban went seven and six and lost to a Sun Belt team year one in Bama. Pete Carroll went six and six at USC his first year, and I don't know who they stubbed their toe against, but I mean they 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 were six and six, right? They were good one week, horrible the next. So if you can get to that that baseline of bowl eligible and at least 500 because of inconsistency and new, then you can really get some momentum. We've talked about momentum a lot with the football program in Nebraska, and I, I really truly think they can, they can have some. And I think as we look at this team uh, way, way early from a spring standpoint and beyond, I think the offense is going to have to be your – your comfort zone, just because defensively, it's going to take a little while for White to get the coaches on, not on board, but where he wants them to teach their positions. But I think we saw last year with Bill Bush stepping in mid-season and changing that defense around. That you know what, you can get a defense installed quickly. It's not going to be the the the, the full extent of what right. you want your can defense. You, can you to win be. with your your vanilla? Sure. And then as the year goes on, can you start sprinkling in more and more? And you know what? You change up your game plan week by week. But that's, a, if anything, that's what Bill Bush proved to me last season was that you can get a defense turned around and playing different schemes. I mean, defense is, is different than offense. I don't think you can change an offense midseason, but he proved to me last year, you know what? You can amend a defense and make mm-hmm. it fit the personnel that you have in season and get it working right. And, and I know the three three five is different than what Nebraska was running, but I mean, Come on. I mean, if you can have a full six months to get your guys understanding what their roles are in their, their base defenses and their cover two, their cover three. Can what you go play it fast? Have, yeah, that's what it comes down to. You got to get the guys playing fast. And, and that's what Bill Bush showed me last year is he got those guys playing fast by the end of the season. So I, while there is going to be change on the defensive side of the ball, I think you can get those guys playing up to a competent level if – you can make this scheme fit the personnel. Well, just have the unit be playing up to the level where they they win the games they're supposed to, mm-hmm. because that's something that hasn't gone right, and that goes into my predi- or my expectation for next year as well. Just win the games you you're, you're supposed to win, right? Like you have your first two home games of this year are games you're supposed to win, mm-hmm. and last year we didn't see that, right? Or even when they did win, it was a struggle to get to the finish line, right? So just win the games you're supposed to win. I think that falls into the realistic expectation 
for year one Matt Rule, mm. and then you can start talking about top 25 Matt Rule, maybe on the bubble of a playoff Matt Rule going I, forward. I, you know, and, and I think he'll he'll get some difference maker talent-wise. And can these guys get coached up? Can they deliver? Can they play confident? That's the biggest thing. I think confidence has been in, in short supply. And when you're losing to Georgia Southern, it's going to kill your confidence. Mm-hmm. When you lose to North, when, when you got to struggle, like you're taking on Texas or Oklahoma. Hmm. It, it's, I mean, seriously. I mean, that's that's how big a struggle the North Dakota game was. Ken emails in Chris at HaleVarsity.com. Wow. Capital Wow. That's a low, capital low, bar. Sad reality. That's that's where you're at. And I go back to the, real. the talking point of what she should be versus what you are. And Nebraska, for too long, has not lived up to what they are. And they've underachieved. They've been a bowl program. They've fallen way, way short just through preparation, play, depth, and in some instances, talent. You, you have one year where you get annihilated by Michigan, but the previous year, you're fumble away from going down to, to, to knock them off. How far is the gap? Mitch Sherman's on the way. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Thanks for hanging out. Hale Varsity, presented by Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark. Give us a find on Twitter at Schmidt underscore radio at Herbal Essence. At Connor Clark, and we'll just spell that out for you, at C underscore Clark underscore 27. Without further ado, we uh, welcome in from The Athletic, Mitch Sherman joins us at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, what's the good word? How are we doing? I'm doing well. How are things with you guys? We're, uh, we're doing all right. We, we thought about playing a little wiffle ball in the parking lot ahead of today's show, but Somebody needs to ice his arm a little bigger than I, a little, little more than, than in past as I age. So we didn't quite get that done. But, hey, it's uh, plenty of uh, football to talk about in the off season and Yeah, I'm just happy that Schmitty's here not in the golf course today. It's a, it's a shocker. <laughs> wow. It's just a, Jeez. It's a shot right It would there be a me. nice day to get out on the course. You can just you go can out. get 45, 50 degrees in February. There's, there's, uh, there's no, no shame in that. Uh, absolutely not. Mitch, we kind of got rolling here this first segment talking about meeting expectations and and we're a ways away from, from fall camp. We're a ways away from spring football. Recruiting just wrapped up. But let me ask you this to start. How, how many games do you think Nebraska has been underachieving by? A season. Do you think they've been a six or seven win club? And I'm and I'm asking you to, to kind of group a couple of different coaching ten years, or do you think <clears throat> they are what they are? Three and nine is three and nine, four and eight, five and seven, whatever it's been. They've not been bowl worthy since twenty sixteen. And and I just I wanted to get your, your insight on this, just what, what you think uh, Nebraska has been. Have they been a team that's just fallen short. They've had too much talent to be bowless, or does it matter? They, they've they've missed to move on. Well, it doesn't matter in the end, and it, and it is time to move on, as Trev Alberts has made clear. But you know, it's also natural to look back, and I think it's important to look back to to on some level because it's you know you're doomed to repeat your mistakes, I think, if you don't look at past performance. Uh, although with the new coaching regime and, and an entirely new administrative side and strength side in football, it is, a, it is a clean break and there is a fresh start. But, you know, I, I think over the course of many years, you, you, you really, there's a saying that you are what your record says you are. And you know, that has to be can taken into consideration with Nebraska. So on one side of it, absolutely. This is, is not you, – you, they're not underachieving or overachieving. They're just achieving at the level that this, that this program has allowed them to. And it's not all about talent. You know, it's about all kinds of stuff that has gone into the formula that's, that's spit out a 4-8 and eight season and a 3-9 and nine season and another 4-8 and eight season. So if you're just looking at the talent – you know, which I think is what you're 
mostly getting at here, and it's usually what people want to analyze and sometimes forget the -the behind-the-scenes stuff, then Nebraska should have been better. Nebraska should have been better than uh, six consecutive seasons without a a bowl game appearance. So that's just the that's I think just the reality of it that there were there was more talent on the roster than what the the win total was showing. But um, everything put together that went into making the program, this is what it spit out. So. This is what Nebraska is, and you know it's what Nebraska deserved to be. Probably um, all everything taken into consideration. So, Mitch, if it's not a talent issue, which I don't think anyone would argue that the talent over the past couple of years has you know been up to the level of 2009 Nebraska or back in the 90s, but I. I would subscribe to the notion that the talent has been there to at least make a bowl game. So what does Nebraska need in year one under Matt Rule to make a bowl game if it's not the talent? Well, you know, and they're trending in this direction. It's got to be a functional organization. And from the administrative side, you know, the other things I mentioned, strength and conditioning, just need to be on the same page and and be uh, uh, a team, a program, that is that is put together that uh, is coming much closer to maximizing its potential than what we've seen in in recent seasons. So I, the, the, the talent again is going to be there for Nebraska to win enough, you know, to, to be a 500 or better team. I, I don't, you know, Matt Rule has certainly upgraded the talent, has upgraded the roster in the two months that he's been here. Um, I don't mean that he's upgraded it over the 2022 team, but what he was left with the mm-hmm. departures from 2022, he's definitely upgraded it through the, the newcomers that, he, that he's brought in. Um, they've got a lot of work to do in the spring and in preseason camp and throughout the season to get to a place where they can be a bowl team, but it's not out of the, out of the reach and, and, you know, with their schedule and, the improvement that that is available, the ceiling that that the players that, that that are coming back and that have been added to the roster have that they they just need to do a better job of maximizing um, in all areas of the program and and you know like I said and, and the previous answer talent is just a piece of, one piece of that. Mitch Sherman is with us on Hale Varsity Radio and Mitch. Last segment we were talking about how what is a, a realistic kind of view of the team next year. I'm more on the six and six train. At, that's kind of my realistic expectation. But we've seen a multitude of programs around the country do about a two year rebuild. So, do you think it's fair to have you know more of a top twenty five expectation in year two? Obviously, if year one goes according to plan with a postseason berth, or do you still want to see people wait a little bit longer than that two year period? People are going to have expectations, you know, whether it's fair or not. That's that's. That's college football. You know, that's just sports. So, I, well, I would say I want to see what spring looks like. You know, I want to see what August looks like. I want to hear from the coaches. and Because, and, you know, when the questions have been asked of Matt Rule and, and his assistant coaches that we've heard from so far, and we'll hear from Bob Wager and Garrett McGuire on Thursday as they get close to, to introducing everybody on the staff, um, when we've heard from them, the, the answers have been, I, I don't know yet. I mean, it's too soon to be able to break down positions and talk about guys who might move sides of the ball or, you know, who's the leader in this room. They're, they're starting over. Um, you know, they're allowing these players to, to have a, a start over. So from that perspective, it's too early to put expectations w- w- as far as win totals on this team. But that's not going to stop people from doing it. And, you know, one way, as you mentioned – Connor, that you can look at it is what has happened with other other programs in in their in the, the beginning of of their resets under new coaches and what we've seen, I think, because of the transfer portal, um, because of the situation you have now with unlimited initial counters and Nebraska's over forty or will be over forty, it already is probably over 40 as far as the guys added to scholarship in, in August. Um, and that's way above what it can, what it can normally be, um, what it was for Matt Rule in year one at Temple or Baylor. 
things have gone faster, and you see it all over the country. There were numerous examples in, in the 2022 season of teams in their first or second year that overachieved. So that's going to lead to high expectations in Nebraska. And, you know, I'd say right now, you, you know, you, you want to think, um, if you're looking at this program, that, yeah, they're going to make a big jump and go to a bowl game in year one and then take off to another level in year two. Mitch Sherman's with us, The Athletic, Hale Varsity Radio, at Mitch Sherman on Twitter. Mitch, your story that uh, came out in The Athletic uh, focuses on Hassan Reddick, and I love the, the hybrid uh, edge position in college football. They are such a, a difference maker. They do their, their, their normal 9-5 to five within a defense, but they can, can be part of a difference-making strip sack or – pressure or or some sort of key turnover and in your story you touch on tinkering right uh, do, you, do you anticipate a lot of tinkering uh, from Matt Rule with uh, a, a lot of the athletes he has to choose from and work with at Nebraska yes that's that's his coaching pedigree that's the model that he's put into play when he's started over at at previous college stops. You know, you can't do that in the NFL. That's a, that's a different – you can do it a little bit. But, you know, players are at a different place in their development when they get drafted or signed as, as free agents into the NFL. And, and to, to go in and, and move a guy from offense to defense is really unusual. And I think it's part of the reason that he's a better fit for college because that's what he does and that's what he did at Temple. That's what he did at Baylor was really – Take a close look at everybody. You know, I, I, the the idea for, for writing that story was born one because Hassan Reddick is tearing up the NFL and he has you know nineteen and a half sacks in the regular season and postseason and you know he knocked Brock Purdy out of the NFC Championship game. Um, you know, so that jumped out to me. But also listening to Matt Rule on signing day last week talk about how he asks his coordinators and he will do this with Tony White and and Marcus Satterfield this spring and then again in the fall to rank. They're playmakers, and you know, so so you don't get caught up necessarily in well, this guy's our number three defensive tackle, or this guy's our number three inside linebacker, and you just just rank your playmakers and who's best at affecting the ball. That that's really interesting because then then you try to get those guys on the field, and if it means that they have to make a position switch, or it's best for the team to, to make for them to make a position switch, then that's that's where that comes from and he's he has such a history of doing that and i mean reddick is like the most high profile example and he's six foot one 240 pounds so you know if nebraska recruited a player who had his measurables right now it wouldn't even jump out it'd be like oh okay they got a, a you know a, a, a run-of-the-mill you know three-star <laughs> edge rusher there's guys in nebraska <laughs> class that look more physically impressive just on paper than hassan reddick and he's going out there as, as maybe the most disruptive defensive player in his team's run to the Super Bowl. So it's not all about um, the measurables and things like that. And, and that's, that's at the heart, I think, of, of a lot of what Rule does in developing players and finding talent in places that a lot of college, pro- college programs are unable to do it. Mitch, quickly, we got about 90 seconds left here, maybe a little bit less. When you look at this, and, and Matt Rule's development, one of his big things is getting guys in the field early if he thinks that they can be difference makers. Do you, do you think that Nebraska might be seeing more freshmen on the field next season than we're accustomed to, or is that just not realistic with the type of guys Nebraska has their upperclassmen? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, don't, I don't think it's going to be a huge number. I mean, I think when guys are ready, they'll, they'll get the chance. You might see some up front on defense. You know, they're, they're uh, a number of the freshmen that they signed at the edge rusher spot. And, we'll, and I don't even know what that, that defensive end or edge rusher spot is, is entirely going to look like in Tony White's scheme. Uh, we'll learn more about that this spring. But th- just th- those guys, you know, Maverick Noonan, Cam Lenhart, um, a few others are, are at the top of the list of, of some of the maybe more developed freshmen that they signed. But there aren't a ton that jump off the page to me and, and thinking, all right, this guy's going to get on the field. He's going to be a starter. Maybe there'll be guys that play on special teams or as backups. I think more of the newcomers, obviously, who are going to make an immediate impact are the guys out of the portal. And there's and there's several in that group that need to be impact players for, for this team to, to get where, where that rule wants it to be in year one. Mitch, we'll see you on Thursday. Thanks for a few minutes today. Okay, thanks, guys. Take care.
in 402-466-ESPN or email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. Just try me. Try me. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. Good stuff from Mitch Sherman uh, podcast, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. Individualized segments of the whole show. Take us with or just check out the Hail Varsity YouTube channel. We'll get back to football 20 minutes away from Ron Brown in his new role with uh, Nebraska football. Also, Jeff Smith, uh, basketball insider, high school coach extraordinaire, Hall of Famer, and uh, longtime assistant with Nebraska. We'll dive into some of the prep matchups and uh, Nebraska Michigan tomorrow. One guy that He's not just a guy, but a, a dude that Jeff Smith's had a chance to spend some time with is LeBron James. LeBron going for the NBA all-time scoring record, and that could uh, come down tonight. We're not huge on the NBA, but LeBron's always been a, a topic of conversation for sports fans, and there's always going to be Team LeBron guys, and then there's going to be folks that just – can't take LeBron or don't appreciate the greatness and you know you've got the 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 GOAT discussion and you know I look at the the fact he's going to break Kareem's record and when I was a kid Kareem was the dude like Kareem had bad hair because he was balding but he had those damn goggles and he was unstoppable with the skyhook it was incredible it was incredible to, to watch LeBron has continued to, keeping with the the word of the day, tinker, uh, tinker with his game, where he's not just a freight train at 6'8", getting to the rim at 260, but he's got the step back three, he's able to get his own shot, baseline turnaround, and from an an assist standpoint, he has got so much Magic Johnson in him that with terrible teams or with a great supporting cast, he's been able to, to make the right basketball play down the stretch, He's just unfortunately trusted guys too many times that has, in some people's, not mine, but in some people's mind has tainted his legacy. So does this mean anything to you? Is it a finish line moment for LeBron's greatness? Okay, you want stats, here we go. He's won rings. He's lived up to the hype of a 16-year-old on the cover of Sports Illustrated, and he has over-delivered this hype of how good a basketball player she's supposed to be, high school to NBA jump and killing it from the get-go maturity level-wise. And now I look at LeBron as a guy that's going to take down a sacred record that's lasted for almost 40 years. And, and he's done it, and he's done it with the pressure of the world and the expectations of the world. I'm always going to be a Jordan guy. That's that's my neighborhood. That's what I grew up with. And it's a different NBA. I think it's no disrespect. You've got greater athletes, but a softer NBA now. You don't have as great of athletes, but still incredible ball players during the Jordan era. But it was full of Lambeers and Rick Mahorns and guys that could take your head off in a seven-game series, and you still had to play with a cracked rib. It didn't matter. So you had a tougher NBA, but not as athletic. So... A little difference there, but this is this is cool for him. I'm I'm happy for him, and he's he's nostalgic. I mean, I, I think if he has a chance to, to to tie and break the record, he's gonna he's gonna put an ode out to Kareem in that Laker gold. Well, I mean, similar to your generation, LeBron James is basketball to me. For as long as I can remember, it's been LeBron James going and dominating. Like I, my earliest memories are his. Cavaliers teams going and losing to the Celtics in the Eastern Conference Finals. Those Cav teams had no business being as good as they were, and it was all him. Well, those Cavaliers teams, aside from LeBron James, were not playoff teams. No. You had LeBron James to those There's teams. 60 like, lost teams. They're going to the Eastern Conference Finals. Everyone say, well, is LeBron James ever going to be able to get over that hump? Well, he goes to Miami, and as you said, he tinkered with his game. He kind of reinvented himself. And he became a, was it a three-time NBA champion in Miami? Two. Wait, Two yeah. time, two time. Excuse me. Far, uh, far different than the uh, the the stage moment of counting to six, seven, eight. Yeah, well, it's okay. should have won all four, I, but I, that's where I'll leave it. Anyway, I'll, I'll just say he, he tinkered with his game. He added a real post presence where he go post guys up on the block and make plays that way, and then he goes to to Cleveland again and wins a championship there, and he does it. Uh, by reinventing his game yet again. He adds a, a three-point element, and he, he kind of becomes more of a, a point-forward type 
for that Cleveland team and then combine that with the, the talent that Kyrie Irving brought to that team. And it was incredible. And then he goes off to L.A., wins himself another title, even though it was a, a Mickey Mouse title down in the Disney World with COVID. He still won the title. That See, that's an interesting debate, too, because I, I'll – sorry to cut you off. I'll let you finish here. But I think – the NBA title that year is the most legitimate out of all the sports. But COVID year? Yeah. Because everyone's stuck in a bubble? Well, yeah, because think about how mentally taxing that was. And I'm a Jordan guy too, but this is where I'll come to LeBron's defense here. I mean, that was – they were there for three months. They didn't go anywhere. They were in a hotel room or on a basketball court, and they still took care of business. And I know he had a really good team, but he performed out of his mind. There were – T.J. Warren was one of the best players in the bubble. Like you had guys you'd never heard of who were dropping 30 a game in there. Well, the, the, the bubble really differentiated which guys loved basketball. Right. Mm-hmm. Like yeah. when you think of Jamal Murray's bubble performances, because that was a guy that all his other elements of his life were taken away. It was you wake up, it's basketball. You, you take your midday nap, you wake up, it's basketball. You go to the gym that night and you're playing a game, it's basketball. It was just basketball 24-7. And I remember a story from the bubble, I can't remember which player it was, but a reporter walked into an elevator uh, down in Disney World, and uh, there was a player sitting there looking in the little mirror in the the elevator saying, you like this. You like basketball. <laughs> <laughs> basketball is fun. You don't want to go that home. You like want to keep playing basketball. Like, yeah, this it, is not a job. It's a hobby. It, 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 it differentiated who really liked basketball, and the fact exactly. that LeBron James was able to go down there and will his team to a championship. proved. But it just, my basketball watching life has been, it's LeBron James. What do you love about his game? What do the, I love about the, LeBron James' the, game? The brute force. The athleticism, the the will, the drive, the shot making. What 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 is his signature for you? I mean, it's a passion. Le- LeBron James, you never see him take a night off on the basketball court. He always plays with that passion. And some people complain about you know how much he complains to the referees about getting calls and how much uh, they don't like his antics, quote unquote, on the sideline. I mean, he people think it's he makes it all about him, and I get Just that wants argument. To win. But to, yeah, to me, it's, it's the passion. He always wants to be the guy who walks off the floor with a win, and that's the hallmark of, of greatness to me, is that guy who, no matter what is happening in a game, the only thing that he cares about is the win. That, that's what I've always, always appreciated about LeBron. And I, and I through my life, have not always been a, a LeBron James fan. At times, I've even been a hater. But now like, you get to the end of his career, it's like Tom Brady. It's just the same way, where you go, right. you know what? Appreciate the greatness. I'm glad I got to appreciate LeBron James' career. And this is one of those moments in time where you go, wow, this, this guy was just, we were blessed to be able to watch him during his prime. Yeah, I mean, there was a point, too, where I despised LeBron, especially the Miami Heat version of LeBron, because, A, they beat the Bulls every year in the playoffs. So I didn't like that part. And, you know, the not one, not two, not three, uh, the big three and everything. But... Yeah, it's just the way that he plays the game, and he's just a a freak of nature. Like, Mm -hmm. you mentioned 6'8", however, about to 285, and he's coming at you at a million miles an hour. Nobody else can do that. Nobody has ever done that. Nobody else probably will do that. Um, And the fact that he has a chance to make... Yeah, he has has a chance to break the most coveted record in the NBA tonight, which, honestly, I think he will tonight, Mm -hmm. um, is, is pretty incredible. And if you would have told me when I was, you know, in fifth grade watching LeBron James that he'd still be dominating the league whenever I am 24 years old, I would have called you crazy. He is as he's delivered every inch he's supposed to of the hype. That's incredible. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. One final time this hour, Ron Brown, 10 minutes away, his new role. Thoughts on Nebraska football here moving forward. About 10 minutes away and. Hall of Fame coach Jeff Smith to preview Bellevue West on the road tonight against Lincoln Southeast. A top 10 showdown with some Metro high school basketball. Also thoughts from Coach Smith on Nebraska basketball and his buddy LeBron James. He uh, is close with Teron Liu and of course Liu, the head coach when Cleveland won their championship, had a chance to watch some practices. Coach Smith did with LeBron Uh, being the ultimate leader. Reminder to get uh, buckled up. One of every three fatal crashes in Nebraska involves an alcohol-impaired driver. Why take chances? If you drink, don't drive. A message from the Nebraska Department of Highway Safety Office. We'll dive into a topic we hit on earlier. At a question you had, Elijah, as far as the the number of freshmen that could see the field this year, a, a bigger picture on timeline for Nebraska's black shirts to be 
those black shirts with a new defense, a uh, 3 and more of that theme from Mitch's story on, on tinkering and just how it could unleash uh, something special for Nebraska football on the defensive side. Numbers to get in, 466-3776, 466-3776-800-825-5865. can email the show, chris at hailvarsity.com. So you're a big Denver fan. You love what they got going in the NBA. Oh, the Nuggets. Oh, we're going Nuggets talk? It's been been a while. We are not. Uh, I'm just kind of going around the horn here. You still a Bulls guy? Oh, yeah. Yeah? Oh, yeah? Oh, yeah. Uh, And and I grew up watching the Bulls like every kid in the Midwest. Uh, Had a Pistons phase for a little bit, but too much lamb beer uh, made me switch allegiances. You can do that when you're 12. Back off. (laughs) Uh, and and a guy that I, I really loved was was Charles Barkley. Just and I love watching him on uh, on Inside the NBA with TNT when I get a chance to, or at least what he says outrageous or does outrageously that lives on social media. But you know, it's funny to see the old guard talk about today's era, and it there's high level of respect. There's a lot of impressions. Wow, that guy could play in any era. But there's also, and I love the competitiveness where they're still not willing to concede all the time better. And it's funny how things have evolved with sports and continue to do so. And, you know, I I envision LeBron hitting that hook shot as a tribute to Kareem, kind of like Magic did the tribute to Kareem for that first NBA title because the captain had a uh, a bum ankle in 1980, but uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, I, I don't know where my buddy Garth is at, if he's uh, going to be on site for that as part of the NBA or if he's back in Omaha, but it's um, it's pretty cool. And then you have what, what you have with Golden State, right? I mean, they're still must-see TV with, with Curry, and I know he's dinged, but uh, what, what Steve Kerr's brought to it. So, it's really a fun era right now, and, and NBA is uh, a different, different beast. But it's something that is uh, just you just stop and shake your head about the athleticism. Well, and the unnecessary drama in the NBA today. Have you, have you seen <laughs> it? There's so much unnecessary drama, and I it can, yeah. it can wear some people out. I enjoy yeah. it, like Jean Morant's friends from the hood pulling up and shining red dots into somebody's car. <laughs> like, what are we doing? That's crazy. Know, sit back That's and appreciate no. the drama. It's great. <laughs> That's a no. I got my guys back. Right. Coach Brown on the way. Welcome to Hale Varsity Radio, the voice of Husker Nation. Insight, opinion, expertise with the biggest and best names talking Nebraska across the state. Join the show on Twitter at Hale Varsity and at Schmitz underscore radio. Call in at 402-466-ESPN or 1-800-825-5865. Here's Chris Schmitz. Back into it, it's Hour 2, it's Hale Varsity Radio, presented by Currency, longtime part of the Nebraska football program, Ron Brown back with us. Coach, how's, uh, well, it's February now, how's February treating you? <laughs> Good, Schmitty. Good. Good to hear from you again, man. Hey, yeah. it's it's always awesome to, to get a chance to sit down with you, Coach, and uh, you know what? I, I love uh, talking ball with you and getting your perspective on things. I want to start off with just your role here with Coach Rule and and what your job is now with uh, with Big Red Football. Yeah, sure, uh, Schmidt. Uh, Coach Rule and I have had some good visits, and uh, you know I'm I'm thankful that uh, he gave me another opportunity to be here at Nebraska. So it's actually my it's my sixth head coach that I'm working for here in Nebraska, fifth decade, 30th year. So I, you know, I'm, it's a great privilege to be at at this place for so long. And, and then I love the people here in the state of Nebraska. So yeah, I'm the director of player support and outreach, which really it's me offering wisdom for our players and their lives personally when they want it and when they need it. And it's also me setting up and accompanying them on community outreach opportunities across the state of Nebraska uh, to coach and teach middle school youngsters in both football and character, kind of a hands-on thing. 
So I think it's a great thing uh, to have our players investing in the kids and the people across this uh, uniquely great state. So I, I just thank the Lord for the for the opportunity. Ron Brown with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, you hit on such a important age group, the the yeah. junior high era, <laughs> and how yeah. how uh, how impressionable kids are in junior high, and just the ability to be in the community and have Nebraska football associated. That's an awesome idea. You know, uh, Shmidi, you, you're right. It's a, it's a it's a it's an important point because I was listening to some uh, Barna research. Um, material not long ago, and um, you know it it, it 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 appears that a world view of a youngster uh, by the age of thirteen they pretty much have it, and so that's why I know a lot of uh, NFL coaches over the years um, have told me they get a little frustrated in their coaching because they feel like the players that come to them have already established so many of their habits, their foundation, um, and just who they are. It, it becomes difficult to see much change. You get a little bit more change in college, but even even then, I say, Schmidt, today, as I look at a lot of college athletes, many of them are, you know, are, are shaped and have set ways, and it's difficult to, you know, if there's a need for change – it's, it's awfully difficult when you get past those teenage years, especially the early teens. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think you're right, man. I I love the middle school kids. Uh, many of them are starting to be recruited now because they're, they're, off, they're hitting at a high level of skill early on in their lives. And so I think it's a great time to, uh, to emphasize that age group. Ron Brown with us here on Hale Varsity. Coach, what are some of the challenges – uh, that are a reality for today's athlete, this new era of college football. You've got some good NIL. You have the challenge uh, in the portal, my words, uh, and, and it can be good or bad, but it's different than it's been for a lot of years. But you got to adapt, and, and that's what college football has done. And with your new role, how, uh, how are you going to help navigate that for Nebraska? Well, you know, uh, Shemitty, you, you make a, a good point, good or bad. NIL, transfer portal, can be good or bad. It's kind of like the the analogy that I have for it, Shmitty, is like that beautiful car you got sitting in your driveway. Looks like it can go, man. Looks like it's got all the, the stuff that, where it can go, can go fast and it can be durable. Um, but you really don't know much about it until you look under the hood. And I think that's where it comes down to people. What's under the hood? What's inside of us? What's inside of these young men? Because who they are inside will determine often how far they'll go and how efficient they'll be. And so the NIL can be good for a young man who's thinking right. The transfer portal can be good for a young man who's thinking right. But no matter um, who we are on the outside and no matter all the opportunities you have through NIL or transfer, if you're not the right man inside, you're going to blow lots of opportunities. It's not going to go well. That's well put. And uh, it's all about uh, kind of that internal engine, right? And uh, I'm, I'm interested to get a little history or, or background with, with you and Coach Rule. I, I'm fascinated with just the the process of his time from the NFL to to now in Lincoln and just the the work that went into to getting him to Lincoln and I think his track record is incredible so uh just from from my vantage point in the media I look at what he's done where he's been super impressed with uh with his track record how far back or do you go back at all with coach rule in your coaching career I would say the first uh, time I've encountered Coach Rule was when I was coaching at Liberty University. And my third season at Liberty, our, our opening game in 2017 was at Baylor. And it was Coach Rule's first game. 
uh, at Baylor as a, as a head coach. In fact, I think um, yeah, that was, uh, yeah, it was the first game down in Baylor. And I'll tell you what, he inherited a Baylor team that really was struggling. Um, and we ended up winning that game. It was one of the top upsets in college football um, throughout the, for, for the last several years. But, you know, Coach Rule had inherited a team that was really struggling. And they went 1-10 or 1-11, I think, that year in 2017. And then he remarkably uh, turned that team around. That was uh, an unbelievable turnaround. The next two or three years when he was at, while he was at uh, Baylor, before he went to the NFL, that, that was one of the more magnificent turnarounds. Because if you remember, Baylor also went through lots of internal issues mm-hmm. with players and so forth mm-hmm. and coaches being fired and players being removed. And I mean, it was all kinds of things going on. But um, so he had to navigate through all that, did a great job. And of course, prior to that, he had done that at Temple, and Temple's not an easy place to win. I, I've, I'm, I'm from around there, you know, and spent a lot of time back east, been to Temple, uh, been to that environment. It's not an easy place to recruit or to coach, and he did a, a great job there. So, yeah, a- absolutely. His track record speaks for itself. What was your impression uh, with uh... – with him at Baylor, I know it was a quick snippet, but did you connect before the game, after the game? Uh, what what impression was made, or was it just more about the, the the chance to get to know each other when he came to Lincoln? Yeah, this is really the first time that we've really had conversations since he's come to Lincoln. I I can't say I knew him; mm-hmm. I just knew of him and uh, knew the job that he had done and so forth, and kind of followed him that way, but. Actually, when he came to Lincoln, this was the first time that we had the opportunity to sit down and talk a few times. Ron Brown with us here, a few minutes, Hale Varsity Radio. Coach, you mentioned two regions that have been super important in Nebraska. Uh, and you look at your time in Lincoln, 30 years, five decades, and the the northeast part of the country, Nebraska's really done well historically recruiting the eastern seaboard. Nebraska's mm-hmm. really done well recruiting Texas and Nebraska's always prioritized the state of Nebraska. Those seem to be three big pretty prior, big priorities for Nebraska football here in 2023. Yeah, and, and uh, it's great that we have contacts from these regions. Um, there are places in this country where youngsters will still travel. The northeast part of the country has always been one of those places uh, for people to travel. I mean, there's just, there hasn't been just a lot of dominant mm-hmm. football teams there. Penn State, when I was growing up, was really that school um, and probably the only school that really was a dominant team. So a lot of Northeast kids traveled uh, to the Big Ten places and all over the, the country. So our connections there now with our staff who are from the Northeast certainly is good. But you know, we've also had guys who are who are from the southeast part of the country, Texas, and so I think Coach Rule has put together a staff that represents quite a few regions around the country. But at the at the, at the bottom line, again, though, Schmidt, and I think you know this, um, you still have to do a great job in the 500 mile radius of this university. That has still got to be obviously a mainstay here in both scholarship players and walk-on uh, commitments as well. So Coach Osborne obviously was the master of that. Mm-hmm. Of, uh, back, you know, back in the day, um, Bob Devaney, of course, had opened up great opportunities in New Jersey because of what he had done in Wyoming. And Coach Osborne continued that here at Nebraska. But, but we also uh, – <laughs> We, we also majored in the greater 500-mile radius. That was still very important to the surrounding states here in Nebraska. Ron Brown's with us, Hale Varsity Radio. His uh, new role with Nebraska Player Support and Outreach, Community Outreach, and uh, Coach working on uh, year 30. What does that say when you hear year 30? Uh, does it seem like yesterday? 
<laughs> it seems like yesterday a lot of people say, well, that means you're old, Brown. That means you're really old. In fact, somebody, somebody told me this morning, he says, I, hey, I saw your new physician. I guess you're the official grandpa of uh, of Nebraska football. Man. <laughs> like, yeah, baby. But anyhow, you know, I, I do remember coming here back in 1987 when I was the rook. I mean, I was the baby. I, I was the youngest guy on the staff at 30 years old. And so, um, you know, yeah, I, it's it's really – I can honestly say that through all the difficulties and the ups and downs, it's uh, it's it's been a joyful place to be. I love Nebraska. I thank the Lord for the for the numerous opportunities I've had to be here, and the numerous young men and older men and guys my age across the the years. The relationships have been very very special. You're still in phenomenal shape, though. Someone may give you trouble about being the grandfather, but you're still. <laughs> able to crush him in sit-ups and push-ups that would put money on. Well, you know, uh, I've, I've always told people say, well, you know, hey, how do you, how do you stay in shape at, uh, at your age in the, in your mid sixties and 66, you know? And I just say, Hey man, just don't ever stop. Don't ever <laughs> stop working out, man. Just, just do a little something every day. So anyhow, but That's, no, the Lord is just, the Lord has given me, uh, you know, a, a, a mind that, um, loves uh, to work out still and to be around people who enjoy that portion of their life as well. Super Bowl Sunday, the day none of us work out uh, because of the uh, the (laughs) plates of wings and nachos. How about this matchup? Uh, And there's a lot of Nebraska flavor to it with DiCaprio and Sue and Juergens and Jack Stoll. And, uh, of course, a regional team with the Chiefs that are working on another ring. And then Philly's been as tough as it gets. They look they look incredible. You pretty excited for Sunday? Yeah, I am. Uh, I, I I love high stakes football, man, and and I love seeing our former players out there. You know, I mean, uh, I, I I I don't remember a time when so many Nebraska players, at least it's been a while now, were so many guys were involved in the Super Bowl going at, going at it. Um, and I'm uh, so happy for those guys. It's a testimony to hard work. But, you know, even in the uh, NFL playoffs, too, guys like Stanley Morgan, mm-hmm. you know, out there with the uh, with the Bengals uh, uh, playing. And, and, I, and I follow the guys like Rex and Amir and, and uh, Jano. And, and this is just a bunch of guys that are still playing. So, yeah, it's just uh, it's great to see. But, I, but even the guys who don't play Schmitty, um, you know, maybe they played a little while. Maybe they didn't go to the NFL. Um, I just hope that people realize at some point football is going to fail you. Mm. In other words, it's going to say bye-bye to you. You're going to be too old or you're going to be, um, you know, it's, it's, it's gone on too long, your injuries and so forth. I just hope that, that each, each of you guys just remember a lot of the great things that football taught them, you know, that football was used in their life uh, to – as a as a really as a platform to do a lot of other good things um, in this world, so it's, I'm excited for them. Ron Brown with us here on Hale Varsity Radio. A few more minutes with Coach Brown on the other side, then we'll dive into. It's been a, a day of expectations, right? We've talked about it. We can talk about uh, Coach White and that three three five defense for Nebraska. Uh, we talk about you know win total and year one and rebuild and what's in the room. Coach Rules addressed that multiple times, how good the situation is in Lincoln compared to his previous two stops in college. Well, what's uh, what could be normal for, for the defense in year one with uh, Coach White? Uh, a lot of choices and talent to choose from. We'll wrap things up with Coach Ron Brown. Jeff Smith on the way, Hall of Fame basketball coach, Get his take on the big Metro matchup tonight. Bellevue West at Lincoln Southeast. Also some Husker hoops. We roll forward on a Tuesday. It's Hale Varsity, and we're presented by Currency. And now. And now, back to Hale Varsity Radio. Ron Brown's with us. Coach, we'll leave it with uh, this. And winter conditioning's ongoing right now. Just touch on the the energy and the vibe down at the stadium right now. I like it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, camaraderie 
um, the coaches are, are very enthusiastic, um, very open. Um, there's a lot of, um, um, you, you know, non-pretentious types of things going on. Of course, we all have to continue to improve, and we're building a culture. Uh, coach Rule, though, has been through that. Um, this is he, he's not he's a young coach still, a young head coach, but 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 he's had experience in turning programs around, and so this is not new for him. So so far, I think it's really been there's, there's a lot of energy, and the players are very optimistic and excited. Coach, it seems like he's just got a great ability, sincerely, to connect with guys. Yeah, I mean, and again, you know, so much in life is a fearlessness. You know, you 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 have to have the ability to overcome intimidation, and intimidation comes in a lot of ways. It doesn't just come from somebody getting in your face and threatening your life. Intimidation can be expectations from the media or the fans or a new situation. Um, you got a lot of these coaches who are very young. This, this is one of the youngest coaching staffs in America, if not the youngest. And so, you know, th- th- these guys have to kind of be able to penetrate through the culture of expectation, mm-hmm. uh, p- particularly here in Nebraska, that's been a traditional place of winning and national titles and so forth. And we haven't experienced much of that like we used to uh, in the recent past. So therefore, there's going to be the potential of, you know, wanting to kind of back up or feel sorry for yourself or doubts and so forth. And what I've seen so far are these guys who are saying, uh-uh, man, we're we're putting our foot down. We're going to get after this thing. We're going to let the chips fly. So I like the fearlessness so far that I've seen here. Ron Brown with us. Coach, enjoy your weekend. Enjoy the Super Bowl. We'll get caught up again. Always love spending a few minutes with you. Thanks for your time. You too, Schmitty. God bless you, man. Congratulations on your career too, Schmitty. Man, you've done a lot, man. You've been recognized, um, you know, in this state and nationally and so forth. So uh, keep up the good work, man. I'm always honored to, to do interviews with you. Coach, you're the best. Appreciate you. Good to hear from Ron Brown. And uh, appreciate the compliment there. That was awesome to uh, spend some time with Coach Brown. We'll uh, hear from Jeff Smith in a little bit. But, you know, his uh, statement there, the culture of expectations, we've dove into that a little bit here with with Rule and the rebuild and, you know, spring footballs around the corner. And defensively, guys, and to your point, Elijah, you were talking earlier, we were talking with Mitch Sherman about you know, how many freshmen will see the field. You have a young staff, but they've got experience with rule. And that's going to be key for Nebraska moving forward. And I'm interested here with, you know, what do you get year one as we shrink down from overall to each side of the football? And good story by Sam McEwen about, what Nebraska's defenses have been like that first year. They go from one coordinator, think of the strain in the Diaco era, as short as it was, to year one with chins, right? And what do you go from Bush to White with a whole new defense? And the Nebraska defense and the incredible jump they made in 03 with coach Polini when he, when, when he came in, how, how well that defense played and quite honestly, how incredible that secondary was at taking, taking the football away. 2009, uh, we're talking number one scoring defense in the country, 10 points a ball game. It, it improved from allowing probably about 27 points a ball game all the way down to 10 points a ball game. So that's, that's think about that. That's, that's damn near three touchdowns. So, Nebraska's defense eh, under under Bush, who did a hell of a good job. I think they were allowing twenty six a contest, something like that. But it's been pretty par for the course. Where you're you're giving up twenty eight to thirty, and the question is, what can your offense score in that year one? But by year two, you can see it click. And with White, uh, that first year at Syracuse, they were allowing uh, thirty three a contest. They were down about a touchdown in, in year two, and they were they were down 10 points by that third year before he got hired to Nebraska. So you see the progression 
and you wonder how how quickly what the timeline will look like here. All right, what's three three five or four two look like in your opener against Minnesota when you got your guys identified and the coaches know it and White has taught it to Dion and Boulder to end of September with Harbaugh and Michigan as you make your progression through the season, how much better does the defense get? I know they're going to want to get after the quarterback. That is is obvious. Uh, do they have the personnel to do it? I think they can find guys that their strength is going to be speed off the edge and let's let's disrupt a little bit. Well, and look at how Nebraska's defense last year, I mean, it got better as the year went on once Bush took over. And what was the theme there? Some younger guys fast. started they getting more fast. Well, some younger guys yeah. started getting in and getting more playtime. I think it allowed the whole defense to play fast. You start getting these athletic freshmen on the field that, you know what, they were able to get in and disrupt. When you look at Malcolm Hartzog, uh, how he was able to get more playtime. Ernest. Uh, Ernest Hausman, another guy that got more playtime as the year went on, and, and you saw Nebraska's defense improve. So that's the question in my mind is what type of, of young guys, freshmen, redshirt freshmen are going to start seeing the field next year for this Nebraska defense because anyone with a few exceptions mostly on the lines of scrimmage but anyone who's been a dude at Nebraska has shown at least flashes in year one Amir Abdullah had the kickoff return for a touchdown against Fresno State and it's offense but mm-hmm. he got play time there and Dama can sue before an injury his freshman season he was getting some snaps made a couple tackles then uh got a, a medical red shirt and came back his red shirt freshman year and I believe Though he wasn't starting, I believe he led the team in sacks. I think so. Is that was so, 07 you're talking about? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think he had like seven or eight sacks that year. I believe he led the team in sacks despite not even being a starting defensive lineman. I mean, just, just run down. It's less than the past decade. But the guys that you know of that were dudes at Nebraska were all getting involved their freshman year. Mm-hmm. They may not have been starters, but they got involved somehow. So who is going to get involved for this Husker football team next year? That's either part of this incoming transfer class of, of younger guys I speak to or incoming freshmen. Well, he also said that too, and him being Matt Rule on the Bussin podcast, I believe with Temple, he talked about how we would throw a lot of younger guys into the mix and see what they can do. And he had to kind of talk to the older guys on the team, the more veteran guys, say, hey, I know this may not be ideal, but this is the route we're going to go to try and build this team to be a program that's a force to be reckoned with a couple years down the road. Wouldn't be surprised if he maybe did the same thing or at least a similar approach here. Say, hey, look, we want to throw these younger guys into the fire, see what they do, and if we can develop them two, three years down the road, Nebraska is back to a program that I I don't want to say national championship contender, but one that the ten pe- contender, yeah, one that people can get behind, and one that people are expecting to see. Well, in some of the the, the young names, Eric Fields, Dylan Rogers, to think about, but also you can go younger, but it can be an experienced portal guy, and you don't have a, a ton of experience on third and eight in the SEC, but you've been in college football if you're an MJ Sherman. Or you're a chief borders. I look at Elijah Judy too. Yeah, I, I he, mean, for I, some I'm reason, excited about him. A, a name that has flown under the radar when compared to other transfers, but I believe one year at Texas A&M, still definitely a young guy, mm-hmm. and and has a little bit of experience. Got that that year of college underneath his belt, and I think he wants to step in and be a contributor next season. That's a guy I look at as, as being uh, a part of that group of younger guys that need to come in and contribute if they're going to be something here at Nebraska. Guy, I th- I think too. I mean, you look look at some of the uh, the gray beards. You look at Ty Robinson and look at Reimer and even Henrich. And you have Farmer, right? And you have Newsom. I mean, those guys have been a, a part of the, the high effort and some playmaking, but it's not always been consistent or they've not had the offensive help or the special teams has let them down. Think where the new lease on life they can get in this defense and their fit. I mean, Nash and um, Robinson are, are two guys that, listen, they, they've, they've played quite a bit of football, and, man, they just want to win. Same with Reimer and Henrich. This could, this could really be a, a really nice new leaf for them. Who's on the line? Hello. We have John. John, go for it. Thanks for calling. Yeah. Well, I was really happy this week we got our uh, – prices for tickets next year for football and our families had tickets from the 30s and they dropped the price nicely and we were pretty much 60 percent not going to get the tickets and 40 percent yes now 
we're going to uh, get the football tickets and uh, really appreciate that from the athletic director. I think they're going to need to do something with the basketball program. Uh, you know, I, I hope they can finish out above 500, but I don't know if they can or not, but they should do a similar thing with the basketball tickets, and maybe when you go to the game, you get a 50% discount on a, not a, uh, on a hot dog or popcorn or a drink or something like that if you're taking the time to go. I don't know. I think more important than a hot dog or a drink is I, to, to go watch winning basketball. That's been the problem with football over the past <laughs> couple of years yeah. is they haven't been winning. Yeah, I'll, I'll go fork up some money for basketball tickets if I think they're going to win whenever I go to the game. No one wants to go watch a loss. I think that's a, a bigger problem than, than not having a Is a it just a not assumed, concert or game, whether it's Nebraska or not, you're going to get punched in the face? I mean, I mean, it's just it, it's, it's concession food. Well, the, So know that going in, and from a bribery standpoint, is that – are you going to – okay, think of, think of your they, worst they think of the, Think of the worst – experience you've had as a fan where your team's getting hammered and you're there in person watching is uh half off a freaking dog gonna make you feel any better no no i you know i i don't i'm glad that john's going to to continue to be a fan because you know it's cheaper for him to go and i'm glad that it's gonna work out for his family that's cool that they've been i mean working on 100 years uh, that family with their fan base and uh, putting their money where their mouth is going but yeah as far as basketball goes i mean you, you my, my take is very simple you can support fred and go watch and expect them to fight maybe they'll surprise you and win or you can not go you can get rid of your tickets the crowd on sunday was fantastic. it was and it was great weather i mean there's a hundred other things you could have done but you went because they like this team. They like what he's doing. The wins haven't always come. So, but they've been coming at home more often than they have on the road. So you look at it and you go, you know what? We got a chance at winning this one in front of the home crowd, which is good. And uh, that's been a, it's been a while since you felt that way. Jeff Smith with us next. His take on big red hoops and a big high school matchup tonight. And now, and now back to Hale Varsity Radio. Back with you, Tail Varsity Radio, presented by Currency. Chris Schmidt, Elijah Herbal, Connor Clark. We welcome in Hall of Fame coach Jeff Smith with us to talk some prep basketball. Top 10 showdown, unbeaten. Number one, Bellevue West in Lincoln tonight against Southeast. Also, Husker Hoops on our mind. Coach Smith, thanks for a few minutes. How are we doing? Doing great, Chris. How are you guys doing today? We are good. Before we get to the, the uh, tip-off tonight and Huskers tomorrow, LeBron could uh, take Kareem down tonight. You spent a little bit of time ab- around LeBron, and what what is what is LeBron's defining characteristic for you? I'd say just professionalism. Number one, we were fortunate enough to go in and watch a couple practices and really really be involved because Coach Lou uh, let us come in. And, and the first thing I noticed right right away is his preparation for practice. His his in practice competitiveness and how he pushed himself and the team and then how he took care of himself afterwards you know we wanted to say hello to him and coach let us but we had to wait till after he did cold tub and post stretch and media and uh, but it was worth the wait he was a wonderful guy and but I would just say a, a professional that that has um, all the skills necessary to do what he's doing. Um, and I, w- I was extreme. I can't like him now because he's a Laker, but until then, <laughs> really like the guy. <laughs> he's wearing Celtic green. You're probably going, okay, love the guy. But no, well, I I'd have it. the jersey. No, I know. I know you would. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Smith's with us. Okay, let's get into the top 10 prep showdown. Bell West is just awesome. They are fun, they're well coached, they're uber talented. They're heading down to a hot Southeast team that's really grown up. They are doing phenomenal work. Coach, give us a quick preview of tonight's game. We'll have that locally on KFOR, at least here in Lincoln. Uh, I'll be on it with Coach Smith. But your your rundown of this uh, Southeast progression and then Bell West, just uh, the juggernaut they are. Yeah, I, I had I got a phone call Friday from a, a retired coach that knows the game unbelievably well, and he – he said, I think this Bell West team is one of the best teams I've seen in a long time. They were 
they were running clock on prep, which means they're up 35 or more on prep, the number four team in the state Friday. And, and they, they shoot it well. They've got some young bigs. But really, led by Jose, Josiah Dotzler, who averages about 15 a game, leads him in assists. Um, he rebounds for, for a game himself, obviously going to Creighton. Just a, a fantastic athletic uh, leader and point guard that, that can handle extremely well, understands the great game extremely well. Their other guard, Jaden Jackson, I think is as good. I think he's another surefire D1 prospect. He averages 14 a game. Those two kind of make him go, but they have depth. They play extremely hard with, with a lot of pressure, a lot of switching. Um, they play a little different than other teams that most teams see because of their pressure and defensive and, and the pace they play. Um, they've got a good young post, Robert Garcia, 6'7", sophomore that averages 10 and 6. Um, and, and they, they do a great job of developing players. They do, a, they do a really good job of developing basketball knowledge, um, and, and they can make in-game adjustments. They, they understand time and score. So it's going to be fun to watch them tonight. I think Max Preps has them ranked 21 in the country, um, not ranked in ESPN or USA Today, but got to be knocking on that door, I think. Southeast actually matches up to them pretty well. Southeast has guards with, with Tay Moore and Mari Schumacher and, and uh, B.J. Bradford that are, are athletic enough to hopefully hold their own against the guards of Bell West. And then, and then they go 6'8", six, 6'8", eight, six, eight, and 6'5", so they have the size with Bangot Dak, who leads Southeast, in almost averaging a double-double. Um, and then Wade Voss, who's going to Wayne State, really solid 6'8", player. And then Jake Hilkeman, another 6'5", guy. So as far as looking at physical matchups, Southeast matches up well. And I think it's if I'm, if I'm a Southeast coach right now, I'm thinking this is a pretty good day to play them. They're both coming off kind of tough weekends. Uh, Bell West has the Heartland game Saturday against uh, Bishop. Uh, I can't remember who. Uh, Bishop, uh, Bishop, Walsh. Bishop, Bishop Walsh. They're looking, you know, they could be looking ahead to that, you're thinking, as a coach. So um, I'm hoping that, that Southeast can represent Lincoln pretty well here and, and maybe give them a game. The closest game they've been in is Gretna. They beat Gretna by 11. Every, that's the only one I think that's been under 20. Well, yeah, Coach Smith, what, what Southeast really needs tonight is they need to find a way to get some offense going. It's been a, a tough go for anyone playing Bellevue West to get points on the board. Uh, they've held all but one team they've played this season under 60, and most teams they've held below 50 points. Which, what does it, it make you think whenever the best team in the state this season, they're built around defense as opposed to offense? And I'm not saying their offense is bad, but their defense is where they make their money. Yeah, and I think that's what that's what that's how they spread leads so quickly because they are hard to score on. They switch as good as anybody, and 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 like I said, it's it's different than you see throughout the year. Whenever we played them, we we always prepare with a lot of sip, slip screens, a lot of ghost screens, just to try to keep them off balance and take them out of their defensive game plan. Um, it wasn't easy to do though because along with their principles that they play defensively, um, you know, then they also add add the athletic ability and the length that they always have, and then then they can also turn it up to full court if they need to. So it's about it's about not over dribbling, shortening passing lanes. I'd like to see Southeast put it inside a little bit and take some pressure off by getting the ball in the paint some, see if they can score around the basket, and then inside out game takes pressure off too. But just swinging the ball on them from side to side is not easy, and you've got to be able to be strong enough. Um, but I also think the other, the other thing that's helped Bellevue, Bellevue West is a shot clock. It, it's hard to get good shots against them in 35 seconds sometimes. Coach Jeff Smith is with us, Jeff, about a minute or so here. Husker Hoops going to Michigan tomorrow. Your thoughts on their chances in Ann Arbor? How do you contain Hunter Dickinson? Because – it seems like Michigan is just a completely different team whenever they play at home. Yeah, here, here's my thing with Nebraska. They have done a great job of doubling the post this year. They rotate really early from the baseline side, and he is a, he is a little turnover prone. So the good thing is they've been doing it all year. I don't think they have to change their defensive game plan for Hunter Dickinson. They've played some other good bigs with Zach Eady. So if, if they can continue to – trap him quickly when he's in the low post, then maybe they can create some turnovers. 
I'm telling you, I've been to some practices and Coach Linzer and Coach Howard. This defense is a whole different level than it has been for a long time. I, it has some NBA uh, G League type principles that they're employing that, that has really made them successful on the defensive end. But I really think, Connor, if they can double him every time he touches within what they call the red zone, the post area, they'll, they'll, have, they'll have to make them shoot threes. And if they make them, we're going to get beat. If they miss a few and we can, and we can rebound the ball, uh, which is going to be a challenge, then we'll have a chance. Jeff Smith, Hall of Fame basketball coach, longtime assistant with Nebraska basketball, previewing uh, the prep matchup tonight, uh, Bell West and Southeast. And, of course, his thoughts on Nebraska on the road tomorrow night, 5.30 p.m. tip, Central Time against uh, Michigan. See if Fred and the gang can put back-to-back wins together. Last win on the road was at Minnesota, but uh, Michigan's been scuffling on the road. <laughs> They're different at home, but uh, Nebraska's playing with some confidence. Coach, we'll see you in about an hour and a half for tip-off. Thanks again for jumping on today. You bet. I got a trivia question for Connor and Elijah real quick, though. Go Do for it. it. Who's, the, who's the third leading scorer all-time in the NBA? Behind Kareem and LeBron. Oh, Elgin Baylor? Gosh. Nope. I have no idea. Connor? Carl Malone. The you post. Know, yes. the old, there you go. There's your the trivia old, for the day. The old postman. Miss us? Come here, brother. Give me a hug. Bring it in for the real thing. We're on call for you. Catch the podcast at HailVarsity.com, the ESPN Lincoln app, or download them on iTunes. Saddle up, partner. Back to Hail Varsity Radio. One final time on a Tuesday. Be sure to get the podcast. Give us a rating. Good, bad, ugly. We'll take the feedbacks. Uh, Spotify, iTunes, Google Play. For Hale Varsity Radio, the full show or parts of the show, all there for you. And the full video can watch and uh, enjoy on the Hale Varsity YouTube channel. Chris Schmidt at Schmidt underscore radio. Elijah Herbal at Herbal Essence. And uh, one Connor Clark at C underscore Clark underscore 27. Big thanks today to our guests Ron Brown spent time with us, his new role at Nebraska. Jeff Smith, you just heard on uh, Bell West Southeast, that preview, and also thoughts on Nebraska basketball and LeBron's quest tonight. Mitch Sherman, uh, all over Nebraska football. Tomorrow, we'll spend time with Evan Bland, Mike Schuhart, uh, Waste Management Opens going on. Uh, we'll hear from Mike Babcock. Tom Rathman going to join us as well, uh, which is pretty good. Uh, and I uh, always love talking uh, with the pride of Grand Island. Tom Rathman's uh, incredible. So, listen, you, you have dialed into diet land. You've been eating pistachios all show. Uh, how's that going? Not well. I mean, <laughs> has anyone ever enjoyed a diet? Like, it's, it's day two, and I'm already like, man, I miss give, butter. Give me, <laughs> <laughs> give me some biscuits and gravy. Don't, don't even say that. Like, what, uh, right? You're going you're gonna to break down. You're going to army crawl over to Virginia's here in about two seconds. No, no. I, I got to hold firm. As I said. You're going to walk outside. The waft of biscuits and gravy or chicken fried steak is going to hit you. And you'll be like, uh, you're just going to sprint. You're going to get me there no, by I'm, talking I'm, about it, too. I am Jeez. a very competitive person, and that's why we, we put out in this with my roommates, is that whoever wins this fitness challenge, this diet challenge, doesn't have to pay rent for the month of June. Oh. And the roommates, the other roommates that have lost, have to pay for that roommate's rent. Wow. I am very competitive. I have already said this. I am not losing. I am not paying rent in the month of June. That's high on. stakes. That's what I'm saying. That's I, no I, I, need, I need some stakes at the end if I want this to succeed. So with with this being on the line, I am not going to lose. It's as simple as that. It's it's a battle of what wills. do you want to drop to? Doesn't really matter as long as I win. Okay. <laughs> so it's just like the Biggest Loser. So if you lose 12 pounds, oh, by I'm going to lose more than 12 pounds. Oh, point oh. point is is if you got to have one more pound than the other guy. We'll see. I, I've I've been sitting somewhere in the range of two thirty uh, over the past couple of months. So you're six I, five, though, aren't you? I'm six three. So if I can get down below two, six three, two thirty is good. I I would kill to be six three. If I can get down below two ten, so down below two ten by June, I I think would be a good number for me to be at. Well, hang in there. I'm going to keep tweeting pictures of 
just the spread of Sunday <laughs> at you. As I said, at just, home just to help, just to help those rice cakes. Yeah, to help said, the, yeah, the old, I was say oatmeal rice cakes. The, the metal toughness. Got a got a call from my buddy Jay Bird earlier, and he is on his way to Arizona with a with a group of buddies and wives, and they nailed down a year ago a house to rent. And they're going to the waste management. They're not going to go to the Super Bowl, but they're in this like sweet, sweet setup. And they, it's not cheap, but it's way better than the 25 grand people are asking for to, uh, to rent a week in Arizona. Mm-hmm. So, uh, tip of the cap to those guys. Back at four tomorrow on Hale Varsity. Thanks.